what Dante of Devil May Cry did for the monster hunter, Bayonetta does for the witch. In Devil May Cry, the noble knight of justice is modernized into a cocky, sarcastic, dismissive wisecracker, just as likely to use an ancient sword that cripples evil as modern day firearms he twirls around like a child playing cowboy. Nearly a decade later, the same director brought us Bayonetta and asks what a witch living in the present might be like. Well, she'd be an ass-kicking action star. With magic powers come super strength and wicked reflexes, so why be coy about it? Witch dances still cast spells and summon demons, but now those dances are a lot more flirtatious, suggestive, liberated, or provocative. Strap some guns to a witch's hands and feet and the dance can be a trigger for a rain of bullets. A witch of old might enchant an object like a broom to fly around on. But why do that today now missiles exist that you can turn into your own personal jet? This modern witch consorts with the underworld too, but the present day equivalent, hanging out with gangsters and wise guys. Forget about it! She's also a woman, and for a video game dame, she's quite refreshing. I feel like a fucking celebrity in this town. A lot of the time, ass-kicker video game women take on a traditionally male aesthetic, reserved in both demeanor and appearance. Like, they have to dress and quote-unquote act more male to be taken seriously or be cool. Bayonetta is strong, but she doesn't feel the need to excise her femininity to be convincingly so. Giant stilettos come out of the sky to crush her foes, her lock-on is depicted as a pair of luscious lips, she blows a kiss to activate, her guns aren't functional grey metal, but colourful and adorned with jewels. Her theme tunes aren't rock and roll or grungy, but instead range from classy to scandalous. Not to say one way of depicting a female protagonist in a game is inherently better than another, but this approach is the outlier, so it makes for a fun shake-up when playing as Bayonetta, both when the game came out on release and, to be honest, when going back to the game today. Outwardly girly characters usually take the role of healers or villains, and not protagonist ass kickers I'm not much for the talkative types. How about we have a little fun instead? Bayonetta loves to overindulge and flaunt with glee in the cutscenes, and the gameplay is no different. It's not enough to shoot an enemy dead, she has to summon a demon or torture device to maul and maim them as she does a strut or a dance. This attitude of indulgent excess is reflected in the game's design. You boot the game up and you get an ominous minute-long flashback before the title screen. Start a file and you get a four-minute gameplay flashback to play where you fight hordes of enemies on a falling clock face. And then you get a prologue chapter that starts with a five minute long fight scene before the gameplay even starts in that one. Before this prologue is up, there's a plane crash and Bayonetta battles on the back of the plane and then she goes to a bar to get her guns for the game, Scarborough Fair, and does a 30 second equip dance and then 45 minutes after boot, Bayonetta travels to Europe where chapter one begins and we get the title drop. It's an obscene opening, but also admirable. It's exhausting, yet also well produced and executed, it's hard to complain. Well, almost also well produced. The game has a dizzying amount of excessive action cutscenes that show off the main characters in spectacular fashion, like few other games do. But I suppose the trade-off for that is that a lot of other cutscenes are presented as stills, like they ran out of steam a little bit. It's not the biggest deal, obviously with infinite time you'd want every cutscene to be fully animated, but usually the stilted presentation is relegated to conversations. Usually. It's brilliant, mummy! Wow, such an awe-inspiring still of a city. I mean, these stills stick out for a reason. The game's like going to a high-class restaurant with amazing food, and then you go to the bathroom and the hand dryer's broken. Anyway, combat in this game is really good. In most action games, you hit punch and you're done. Here, with Scarborough Fair, hold punch, and not only will you punch, but a stream of bullets will come out if you keep holding the button. But uh-oh, how long can you stand there before the enemy interrupts your stream? You gotta be careful. Complete a combo string and the final input will also send out a devastating final attack, the Wicked Weave. 
So not only might you want to maximize the damage of your combo by holding down every input in the string, but also you want to finish your string to get that potent final hit. For that, you have the inclusion of dodge offset. Hold an attack input when dodging, and upon leaving the dodge, you can continue a string from where you left off. Getting out of an enemy's way or relocating to a better position doesn't mean the end of a combo. You can even still do damage while dodging on your way over to a safer spot, making the most of the travel time. It really is a genius idea, and works very well in tandem with the game's perfect dodge mechanic, in which evading at just the right moment will trigger a slow-mo effect, which time. Perfect for dealing damage with those prolonged input holds. Dodge offset in the middle of the combo, and you may be able to start a combo out of which time, and then get into which time halfway through. The game certainly wants to encourage this behavior, as attacks performed in which time also grant a combo point bonus. The game has a very deep detailed combo display, you get a lot of information on your current performance. Then at the end of the combo, you immediately get a payout based on your points accrued, encouraging you to stay in the combo as long as possible so as to reap the rewards. It's satisfying to be rewarded for playing really well, but also be encouraged to take risks to maximize your damage. Fight without getting hit in a magic meter fills, which can be spent on immediate wicked weaves outside of the combos, but also on devastating torture attacks with enough saved up. As alluded to before, Bayonetta's movements are dance-like in nature. Even her basic moves have a gracefulness to them that when strung together have a dance performance-like quality. Just shooting your guns while moving has her strutting her stuff like she's on a catwalk. The wicked weaves punctuate each series of movements until the torture attacks crescendo your hopefully untouched dance show. Your last move of all triggers a flurry of photos as if the press is eagerly taking your shot after a job well done. The impact of all your strongest attacks is also very important in giving the combat the right feel. Wicked Weave animations have a perfectly timed build up and release and the game will hold on the triggering of witch time for just long enough for you to savor the success before letting you go to town in the slowed time. Each battle is a dense, tightly woven collection of details that encourages you to not get hit just to see the graceful show continue, but at the same time there comes the thrill of pushing your luck for damage with every input. Everything melts together into something, frankly, euphoric with perfect dodges resulting in such a high reward both in the moment and to your score, and the way every last input can be milked for damage means becoming more efficient equals taking more risks and it's so addicting. Playing it safe might get you a no damage score, getting too brazen with combos and you might take some damage, but managing to pull off both and having those two platinum medals ding onto screen at a battle's end becomes a tantalizing prospect in every fight. The combos offer fun ways to toy with enemies, especially with wicked weaves that can shoot enemies off in different directions depending on what string you make use of. But that said, success in Bayonetta comes less from humiliating foes with elaborate juggles and more about maneuvering around the battlefield to create the space and time needed for delivering powerful single strikes. With so many strings, the game uses smart ways to help you keep track of what will do what and let your inputs become more instinctive. For example, do an all-punch combo and leave a pause before the final hit, and if the combo ended on an even number, the final move will launch. Do an all-punch combo and leave a pause before the final hit and end on an odd number, and it will slam downwards. In fact, with your Scarborough Fairs equipped, a pause can only happen before the last move of the combo. You know if you leave one, you'll be ending that bad boy. Hitting two enemies with the same wicked weave increases your points, so it's something to consider the angle of and... Who wouldn't want to do that anyway? These mechanics would alone probably be enough to make a game like this compelling, but Bayonetta just adds about every other action game mechanic you can think of on top just for the hell of it. Taunting is here, use it to fill up your magic gauge, keep the combo going, and enrage enemies, who will attack faster and be staggered less easy, but give you more combo points for dealing with them. How about a perfect parry move that can trigger witch time? We have that. Stinger, afterburner kick, breakdance, whatever this is. Enemy step, throw that in. Enemies drop weapons that you can pick up and discard on the fly, and it's fun how Bayonetta puts her own spin on how to use the enemy's own attacks. 
And then there's a whole host of optional weapons to collect and keep with different functionality. It's that theme of excess again. You can't really complain about any of this extra stuff being here. There's so much to work with, it's not like one extra element being a bit underwhelming makes the game that much worse. And yet it's hard not to feel a bit underwhelmed by some of the other weapons you can unlock. Your main gun, Scarborough, allow for those prolonged inputs, while the sword charges, and the whip grabs things, and the ice skates ice things. All of this is typical action game stuff, and not as fun as the aforementioned risk-reward of those prolonged gun hits. You can switch at any time between two sets of weapons, each set having a kick weapon and a punch weapon. Sword and whip can only be on the punch button though, and ice skates can only be equipped to kick, so it's not like you can have four of any weapon equipped at once. So you're still fairly limited in your approach. The game needed a third set for instant switching, as I always kept two lots of Scarborough Fair on one set, and wanted the sword on the other, for its high damage wicked weaves. And beyond that, I didn't like like breaking up the action by going into the menu and equipping the whip or something. There are other weapons that also use the prolonged input approach, like Daraga. Here the prolonged inputs let you leave behind bombs or create explosive blasts, but it just feels like a slightly different way to do the same thing Scarborough Fair does. All weapons remain viable because they all permit for dodge offset and wicked weaves, but that also in a way takes away a great deal of their identity. Sure, a lot of them aren't as interesting as Scarborough, but when what separates them is a more generic feature like charging or grabbing, and that weapon feature isn't even the one that does the most damage, that still being Wicked Weaves, which every weapon has, then they come off as doubly redundant. Not unfun to use, just superfluous, or best for very specific situations, which is fine. I could have seen myself whizzing around, grabbing enemies with the whip, if I could still have had a sword and my Scarborough punch on hand too. But since you can't do that, whip grappling just doesn't happen that much when I play. It's perhaps worth pointing out that to be deemed worthy of Bayonetta's best end-level rewards and ranks, it's a game that really wants you to play it its way, relative to many other action games. A detailed real-time combo counter is really useful information, and in a game where every fight is measured and must be just as mastered as the last, or next to get full marks at the end of the level, then it's kind of a necessity. Letting you know that without using Wicked Weaves and Witch Time, your points aren't going to be as high also encourages that exciting, risky playstyle, but in a way disincentivizes experimenting and seeing what you can make happen without using those features. Not cooperating with the game in just one fight will be a black mark on your final score that you might have to work hard to make up for if you take your time and toy with enemies without doing long combo strings and weaves, even if you didn't take any damage. Other times, you might not need to work hard to recover from it if you run into a tiny fight that's easy to get a pure platinum in in about 10 seconds and then you're back on track. A pure platinum that will have just as much weight on your final scorecard as the medal you get from some big 2-3 to three minute fight. I guess that's my issue really, your success depending so much on how many tiny fights there are in a chapter. It feels a little arbitrary. Toying and taunting enemies in a large fight for too long without enough certain specific moves or unbroken combos has the game judging you hard. But own three enemies in a small verse in 10 seconds and the title will clap its hands and give you the points of a genius player. And that's not ideally how I'd want a ranking system in a game like this to be handled. The combat in this game is like a dance, but don't freestyle too much if you want the approval of the judges. Maybe some unmarked encounters could have been fun too, as long as taking damage in them still prevented you from getting a pure platinum at the end of the chapter, to keep the title's alluring appeal of being this game that can be perfected and will recognize you for doing so. Keep in mind, the way you're rated per chapter in this game isn't some exact science divvying up all point deductions proportionally to the size of the mistake. Not all deaths are created equal in Bayonetta. Sure, losing all your health in battle should be given a massive penalty, but that was a series of compounding mistakes. But should death by quick time event give such a huge negative mark too. This is where Bayonetta, the pro gamer test of skill, and Bayonetta the adventure where you play as a witch traveling through a dangerous world clash. 
because obviously not everything you encounter in a dangerous adventure is going to kill you slowly. It would be one thing though if Bayonetta was consistent about that, because sometimes falling off something will be measured in proportion to the mistake. Oh, you slipped up once? Well, we're just going to teleport you back up with a little health loss. But in other places, it's just going to be instant death, I'm afraid. Really, the game should either rate death by combat and death by bullshit differently, or just have every fall or quick time event lose you some health instead of being instant death. Because this stuff is all over the place in Bayonetta. It sucks to make one little error and be smacked with that skull mark at the end. The thing is, are you even a person who cares about an end level rank unless it's the best one possible? Well, I mean, you should. There's still currency bonuses to get based on performance in each fight and at the level's end that are better the higher the medal, even if it's not the highest, which you'll be denied if you make any mistake in a chapter. You don't need all pure platinums to unlock everything in the game. Some regular platinums will do. And even that isn't necessary if you're open to just spending a lot of halos and using a cheat code. But also, I get that if pure platinum is your ambition, one hit from an enemy and death by platform slip up do suddenly become equal mistakes. So fair enough, that might be your argument for why you don't care if one ledge kills you and one ledge doesn't. But the counter argument to that would be that getting pure platinums is for savages only. Jesus, you really get into this shit, don't you? We're talking about chapters that even when sped through can be 15 to 20 minutes long. And not taking any damage for that entire time for pure platinum isn't something the game is expecting from even 1% of players. It's not even a tracked achievement. If you're going for pure platinum for the sweet bragging rights, then I think the fact that not even all pure platinums are created equal might undermine one's drive anyway. There's a trick where if you take damage, you can back out to the main menu and reload at a checkpoint. This won't get you out of every fight. If you end a battle with a low combo score, there's a chance the game is already saved and reloading won't let you start the fight over. Maybe we need a pure pure platinum, a didn't reload to cheat a mistake pure platinum. Just like the reward for all platinums on normal, there's a workaround for everything in Bayonetta, and you can maybe just chalk that up to the game's general cheekiness. But if pure platinum is just just some sicko shit in certain levels, then it should remain as such, without any possible ways to cheat the system with reloads, right? Or if resetting a fight really is intended to be allowed for getting pure platinums, maybe it should be an inbuilt option in the menu for every encounter? instead of making you feel like a criminal for returning to the main menu to do it. The game is very polished for the amount of content present, but it feels like the development ethos was about how much can be added and not how much can be refined, because consistency doesn't seem like a priority as long as something questionable can be balanced out by something else in the game that blows you away. From the non-combat challenges and how the ranking system factors them in, to the cutscenes, to the weapons, to the quality of the levels. <laughs> Oh, we'll get to those. But first, a much bigger complaint. Mashing buttons for torture attacks and boss finishes. Someone must like this, right? Every time on every replay of every level, though? Anyone? Just let it be a cutscene, instead of a question of can I be bothered to mash for a few more rings right now? Alright, guess I'll smash the button and get a few more bob. Can't the visual of it all just be my reward? Do I get extra catharsis from a tired thumb? To be honest, the end of boss button smashing isn't really the worst of it. I mean, that only happens a couple times per chapter, and if it's at the end, you're basically done anyway. It's the torture attacks where mashing or spinning gets annoying. This isn't a last burst of energy from my thumb before we take a breather at the end of a boss fight. This is me mashing mashing and tiring myself out before having to re-engage my brain a second later and mash yet this time while thinking about it. Really, the torture attacks shouldn't be any longer than this. Sometimes they just get stupid long for certain enemies and the animations are the same every time. These long ones don't even look cool at a certain point when other enemies have to stupidly wait around for you to be done. Instant death quick time events would probably just make the game better with their complete omission, but even their execution as as it is, leaves something to be desired. Why not have the buttons somewhat correlate here to the action Bayonetta needs to do? Well, sometimes they correlate really specifically. Here you need to hold forward and hit the jump button to save yourself, which makes sense. But other times it's like, hit the gun button to jump off this thing and get away. Shouldn't it be the jump button? What about this one? Gun button to grab this thing. Gun is sometimes also grab a bird, so we'll give them that one. Wait, no, grab is actually Y and B in Quick Time World. W why isn't it that here? Jump into the side? Shouldn't this one just be dodge? Oh, whatever. 
The whole quick time and button mashing prompt stuff maybe has taken us off track, because Bayonetta has bigger control issues. The way things are mapped to the controller in this game boggle my mind. It's a cascade of weird choices, which is a problem when you can't edit any of it. Let's start with Lock-On. The way Lock-On works in Bayonetta is that first the game chooses by itself which enemy it thinks should be the priority. This is what most action games do, except here the game will show you what it's picked with Bayonetta's lipstick icon, which I quite like. What holding the lock-on button does is keep Bayonetta fixed to the enemy the auto-lock-on has deemed your best choice. So far, so good. What the game doesn't do is give you a button to cycle through enemies with your lock-on engaged, which is a bit disappointing. But still, once you're on the enemy you want to be, being able to stick to that enemy if you want is a good feature. Lock-on is mapped to the right bumper, and you have to hold it. There's no option to make it a toggle. Dodge is on the right trigger, and holding right bumper with one finger while pressing right trigger with another is not comfortable. The developers must have realized this though because while locking on A will now also dodge. So now you have two dodge buttons. If you fire some regular shots with X then press A while locked on to dodge, it's a fair alternative. But if you're locked on while holding Y or B for prolonged inputs then having A become dodge when locked on doesn't actually help much because you'll have to take your thumb off them to go over there. Excluding the option to make lock on a toggle, which to be fair isn't my preferred preferred way for a lock-on to work. Left bumper or left trigger just seem like way better places to put the lock-on button. Left trigger toggles between your two weapon sets and that only has to be pressed once every time you want to use it. Why not switch that with the lock-on? Taunt is on left bumper but you might as well put it on select or something because it's not like I'm moving when doing it. Right bumper would be better for that too because it's not like I can dodge and taunt at the same time. After beating the game, you can unlock an ability that lets you activate Witch Time by expending magic. And that requires the Taunt button to be held down, which suits the left bumper. But well, we could have just made this a toggle, right? It's not like this needed to be held down either. Then there's R3, which snaps the camera behind the player. Lock On will swing the camera towards the enemy you want to lock onto, but sometimes I want to swing the camera around me quickly and not look at a specific enemy, or not look at whatever enemy the game thinks I want to lock onto. Here you're going to be using the face buttons for attacking a lot, and it's a lot of travel time over there. If you're holding Y and B for your prolonged inputs, you won't be able to get over there at all without your third non-existent thumb. The game is on some unhinged mission to keep lock on on right bumper no matter what. To the point that a lot of moves like Stinger, which are performed by holding lock-on and pressing forward with an attack, can just be performed out of lock-on by double tapping forward. Like, they know locking on in this game is a huge pain in the ass. You still gotta lock on to do the dedicated launch though, though a two button pause combo will get you there too pretty quick. Having essentially just one move be lock-on only though is very weird. The sequel to this game made the right choice to put lock-on on left trigger and weapon switch on right bumper. Or whatever you call the equivalent on a Wii U pad. But that's not what I want. I just want custom controls to pick whatever I want. Clicking R3 to turn the camera behind you is inconvenient in a lot of games, but it becomes less of an issue if I can change that. Bayonetta eventually released on PC, where for some completely bonkers reason, there are custom controls for keyboard and mouse, but not for controllers. <laughs> what is going on? As console features get more advanced, system-wide controller mappings are slowly helping these issues in games that don't want to include custom controls built in. But to me, it's like asking the console itself to auto-generate subtitles for your game instead of just putting that feature in the game yourself. Sure, you can create a custom control profile on PS5 or Steam, but that won't change the on-screen prompts in-game, and in a game with quick-time events, that could certainly be an issue. Steam certainly provides in-depth customization in its big picture mode, but modern consoles are still nowhere near close to that. On PlayStation 5, you won't be able to make an input a toggle, for example. And ideally, again, the developers would just make these options available in the game itself. As Bayonetta 1 continues to release on further platforms, Hopefully one day this will cease to be a problem. Unless indicated otherwise, the footage you're seeing of the game in this review is from the Xbox 360 version being played on an Xbox 360. How the game was best played when it first came out. I've always liked the dark colors of this version compared to some other ports, but the main reason to show the original release here 
isn't just to complain about the lack of custom bindings back in the day, but to show you how good this game looked and played in 2009. It's not rock solid or anything, but the game targets 60 frames per second, despite its insane spectacle, and has some very nice clean looking characters and detailed environments too. The game's biggest problem on its original platform is the slowdown. It occurs from time to time, and when it does, timing combos becomes really tricky. Dodge offset becomes a nightmare, you have to hold an input while dodging, then when leaving the dodge, switch to the next input in the right window to continue the combo. Of course, if you want to continue the combo and your next input comes after a pause, that window becomes even trickier because you have to delay just the right amount of time to make it a delayed strike, but not wait too long in case the combo drops. When the game is in a state of slowdown, it will completely throw you off. First time I played Bayonetta, it was on the PS3 version, a notoriously bad port of the game, with terrible performance, awful slowdown, constant frame rate drops, and jacked up loading times all over the place. This is why I didn't get into the game that much originally. I would play that version in spurts because the loading was so annoying, and when I did, the slowdown and terrible FPS prevented me from getting into the combo and dodge offset systems. But let's not let the PS3 version get in the way of admiring the game's visual splendor. Something I really like about the game is while it has very in-depth systems for combat, it doesn't neglect its environments. It also has some great locations to get absorbed in and explore, where you can soak up the great atmosphere. There are destructible objects that prevent them from feeling too static, some of which can even be used in the combat. A lot of benches, there's a lot of place to sit in Bayonetta. Vigrid is a pious town, it has a culture of worship that places it closer to Paradiso more than any other community. Of course, this puritanical place is styled as the polar opposite to the loud, dark, and aggressive Bayonetta, with its calm, soothing, angelic backing music and heavenly golden aesthetic. It's beautiful to stand and admire, but in a way acts as the perfect enemy environment for Bayonetta and the player to find themselves in. Its ethereal atmosphere is almost hypnotizing. It threatens to relax you too much, which is something you're going to want to snap out of to stay alert in battle here. The first few chapters in Vigrid have a nice sense of continuity to them that make it feel like a coherent town you're making your way through. You can even pick up Lauderide, left behind by the journalist that found the amnesiac Bayonetta sealed away before the start of the game. He fills you in on a few curiosities about the town and its past and the witches and sages who lived there, as well as giving you the scoop on some plot points before they're introduced in the cutscenes. However, I was a bit disappointed that this reading didn't go into his journey that much. He doesn't explain how he came upon the information that led him to Bayonetta's whereabouts, and you'd think that would be a fun thing to read about and help the story come full circle. There are also some ham-fisted attempts to slip tutorials into this lore. Ah yes, the majesty of the Great Umbra Witches. They wove magic beyond comprehension. Also, have you heard of the dodge offset? There are a lot of little details that make the initial areas fun to get immersed in. The Umbra Witches were extinguished in a battle with the Lumen Sages years ago, so while sage statues still stand, witch statues lie in ruins and need to be rebuilt to activate their magic ability. Then there's the use of Purgatorio, a plane between the real world and the ethereal world that Bayonetta can do battle in, but while still being in a populated town. I like how if you destroy things, you can see the image of people in the real world react. You can even see Luca in the background of this fight, trying to make sense of what's going on by taking pictures. The convergence of a place of worship and urban center is a terrific one to explore, as are the ruins on its outskirts. That said, the levels are incredibly linear. Some stages with more complex layout I don't think would have hurt, especially when the game is so happy to hide fights and unlockables from you anyway. Unfortunately, the game does falter in the environment department as halfway through it begins to run out of levels. But isn't that just true to life? We run out of levels and just end up visiting the same places over and over. After the boss fight in chapter 7, we get a stage predominantly on a long highway riding a bike. Two chapters that recycle previous level geometry into a kind of remix package. Then we get a boss fight, a small level on a plane, another boss, another another boss, a shmup segment followed by another boss, and then finally we get an original skyscraper stage before the final boss gauntlet. I actually quite like the concept of Bayonetta getting sidetracked mid-game by being kidnapped and forced to fight for survival in Paradiso, or while not letting it get her down at all. But it would have been nice if these levels hadn't been just recycled rooms and areas repurposed as floating platforms. I think one more juicy regular original level in this second half 
could have made up for these minigames and this recycling. The best you get is the cargo plane, but it's a very bland and lifeless environment. Before it, though, you get one fight in this vibrant forest, and a whole forest level could have been really cool to see, but it's just this one little arena. How about a proper level in the militarized holy city at the end? That would have been awesome. What do I think of the minigames? Well, I'm not a fan of the biking. The level is drab looking, you have instant death traps, Shooting the other cars is kind of annoying and not very fun. It's a drag and goes on too long. Really? An angel car? Alright, let's see them explain this one in the lore after I reload here. Oh, human cars were inspired by the angel car. Well, that's terrible. Call me completely deranged, but I do in fact quite like the shmup segment. Yes, it goes on a bit too long, and having it take place before a regular gameplay boss fight is a completely insane move. But the visuals are nice, the ship feels good to control, and leveraging your built-up magic for powerful shots at the right time is satisfying. It's a cool translation of Bayonetta's abilities into the shmup style. I recommend attempting the achievement for getting both platinum medals in this minigame, as honing your skills here outside of your first playthrough, where you're just itching to get back to the regular gameplay, can be quite enjoyable. I'm just a bit of an easy mark for Space Area. Welcome to my fantasy zone. Get ready. That's so cool. Though the camera doing this flip every dodge is nauseating. What, is this supposed to be realistic? Why doesn't the camera do that when Bayonetta flips all the time then? I guess it does stop the stage from being one uninterrupted shot for 15 minutes. I don't know if it's worth it though. One reason I really like the first third of the title is that there's a tremendous energy carrying the game too. There's something very triumphant about it all. Bayonetta strolls with confidence into every fight with a cheeky smile and lays into enemies as her theme song blasts out. The spectacle is ramped up as the fight gets more and more chaotic and it's just instantly smirk inducing. Like hell yeah, fucking video game. Remember these opening chapters were our introduction to a new IP and series and Bayonetta just struts in like she's already a legendary game character with such confidence. You just kind of accept that immediately. There's also a great sense of mystery in the air. Bayo has amnesia and she's in this mystical town being beckoned by an ominous voice. Who is Bayonetta? What is Paradiso planning? Who is the mysterious little girl and why is she here? Why is this other witch attacking us? Did Bayonetta murder this guy Luca's dad, the journalist from the journals? Well, unfortunately, all your answers are dumped on you in one big convoluted expository cutscene near the end. Bayonetta is an extravagant showstopper, so it makes sense that her father would be evil David Bowie. You may address me as father. There is much you have forgotten. But his introduction is heavily undermined by having to explain the entire game's plot in his first appearance. Somehow all the twists are incredibly obvious, and yet at the same time, there's a very confusing magical answer for why they happened. This is also when the backing track starts to overpower the characters. However, I am not the that. Sorry, what? So it basically all amounts to Bayonetta's evil sage father and the angels wanting to summon a super big evil angel, which is no good for everybody else. And to that end, he needed Bayonetta to meet her younger self, and that will power the beast, and he killed Luca's dad with angels for snooping around too much. I think the problem is, this scene, or chunks of this scene, should have come maybe halfway or two-thirds into the title, rather than right at the end. This is the first time you meet this guy, so he has to explain who he even is, what his plan is, why he's a really bad guy, also you feel pumped up for the big fight against him a minute later, and it just isn't enough time to process why I should be eager to kick his ass and have this insanely stylish fight with him. Using Bayonetta's lipstick as a bullet to land the final hit, I mean, no one can deny it's awesome, right? But I only met this villain 10 minutes ago, so it loses a bit of impact. I can get over a convoluted magical plan for a guy to try and create God if it leads to some fun character stuff. And in Bayonetta it does sometimes, and not others. Having Bayonetta look after a kid, you know, it's your typical stuff. Ah, oh, she acts like she doesn't care, but then grows attached. It's just a little too easy, isn't it? You could humanize almost any violent game protagonist by teaming them up with a child. I do like the Luca stuff a lot, though. <laughs> Bayonetta makes fun of him for being a prat, but seeing that she does feel some guilt over his father's death is more subtle and effective characterization than, what, Bayonetta would save a child's life if she could? No way, I guess she's softer than we thought. I mean, yeah, one would hope. Luca is fun too, because it's funny to see this ladies man go up against the final boss of all women. More importantly though, is his role in the story as the closest person for the bulk of the adventure, who is just a regular human guy, which grounds things a little 
Dumbledore, and prevents the whole story from just being a bunch of weird, ancient, magical people slapping each other about. The bulk of the bosses are these big, self-important angel monsters, and the appeal of standing up to and disrespecting these bloviating ancient creatures is certainly there. I love how that comes across in the fight itself as well as in the cutscenes. As the fight is reaching its climax and growing more intense, Bayonetta's upbeat, cheeky music overpowers the dramatic, intimidating, angelic choir chanting of the angels theme. That said, it would have been nice if there was a little more variation in their personalities, keeping their conceitedness but without having them all feel like the same guy. Unfortunately, your witch rival Jean isn't that interesting either. While the duels with her are spectacular, hectic back and forth encounters where you must pay close attention for windows of vulnerability, the game doesn't get me invested in their conflict. The dynamic here isn't that interesting, even though the gameplay is really good, so... So maybe you don't care. <laughs> Jean is just kind of sour and crabby, petulant. You've forgotten your destiny and wasted the past 20 years. Kind of comes across like she wants to speak to Bayonetta's manager. Their exchanges aren't very fun. When you kick her ass for the last time and she starts remembering her time together with Bayonetta as a child, well, geez, I don't care at all. Then it turns out she was under mind control the whole time anyway. Might as well have been fighting one of these angel birds. How long ago was Bayonetta put in that coffin for mom song Fly Me to the Moon to her? Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. Wasn't that song written in the 50s? Oh, she was singing to Bayonetta 500 years ago? Maybe it's like the angel car thing again. Someone overheard this and wrote it down for later. Anyway, everything culminating in a massive fight with a giant god angel at least results in an epic conclusion. It results in an epic fight in space, which while visually spectacular, I'm not the biggest fan of. There's a lot of jumping around to hit glowing balls. There's this great part. Maybe the fight against Boulder should have taken place after this. A one-on-one -on -one fight with a regular-sized humanoid boss allows for the core mechanics to shine more, which could have been a more satisfying way to cap things off. Plus, some distance between the boulder fight and the cutscene introducing him could have helped your resentment towards him percolate a little. Having your protagonist own a god is pretty satisfying, but some personal stakes wouldn't have hurt either. Seeing our tiny witch turn the tables on even this monstrosity is no doubt spectacular and cathartic, though it's still just some big thing. But that said, it is Bayonetta winning the war the witches lost centuries ago, and she did it all without her judgmental clan's help. Like all the boss fights against angels, the battle music turns to Bayonetta's side towards the end. This is the biggest table she's turned so far, and the fact that this time the music that kicks in to signal Bayonetta getting the upper hand is just one of her regular battle themes makes it feel like she's really rubbing it into this giant god thing. Like this is just an average day at the office for Bayonetta. My favorite touch is Bayonetta locking onto the sun to send the final boss into it. Hell yeah. I love it when basic UI elements are used to frame even an outlandish one-off moment like this. From locking on to the most basic enemy at the start of the game to now a literal star, you feel like you've come a long way. Then the game wraps around to the cemetery from the start for one final victory lap. And when Bayonetta is shown to have survived her epic final fight and the final credits appear, it's hard not to feel satisfied. The game mirrors its excessive opening with a climactic hour just as jam-packed, and then there's a dance sequence. The entire game is one big concert that just keeps jamming all night. With every subsequent track, you can feel the exhaustion the performers must be going through as they shred through another banger, and as the last string of the final encore rings out, it's hard to deny the artists this final applause as their names slam onto the screen. And then they do another encore to play us out again. Despite the fact that it's sometimes messy, sometimes haphazardly thought out and thrown together in a mad dash to pump it full of everything, you can tell Bayonetta had a mission statement to create the most audacious, packed-to-the-brim action game possible at the time, a replete with a lot of detail and care, from its most core mechanics to small things like the silky smooth menus that just sort of curl onto the screen. That admirable goal ends up making it such an impressive final product. With its a thousand darts it throws that hit the bullseye more often than they don't. Its overzealousness is probably what leads to its missteps. But every time you go, oh, for fuck's sake. 
this shit. It's usually because some wild spectacle of an idea was thrown into the mix to try and jack up the value of the experience. You don't feel like they were running out of ideas and were just trying to pad the campaign out with whatever wet concept they could quickly throw in there. The infectious passion of this product to shoot and ask questions later in terms of content is what makes it easy to get over the bad parts. It's just like the story. Any underwhelming, convoluted, magical plot is enjoyable with someone as infectious and fun as Bayonetta to ride with on the journey. Which isn't to say, of course, that Bayonetta is just some dumb game that throws shit at the wall. There's some very smart ideas in here that make its system so compelling and worth returning to. Made even more enticing by the extra included difficulties with a bevy of unlockables and remixed enemy encounters to test your new toys on. But that stuff is the cherry on top, because the reality as a game like Bayonetta has such great core mechanics that the worst post-game content possible would still not prevent it from being endlessly replayable. And it has been for me over the years. With almost every new port, I've given it a replay, and even on a fresh save, it completely captures my attention all over again. The visual style, environments, music, breadth of mechanics, and just attitude enraptures the senses. It's a gameplay high I always long to return to after a while away. I'll do whatever crap it takes, smash my way over a quick time event, or ride the highway on a nasty bike, as long as I can get back to Bayonetta.